Coming up next on Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable, the U.S. Supreme Court strikes down part of Arizona's voter registration law. Opponents of Medicaid expansion hope to block the new law with the help of voters and we'll have the latest on the racial profiling suit against the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office. Those stories and more next on the Journalists Roundtable. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable. I'm Ted Simons. Joining me tonight are Amanda Crawford from Bloomberg News, Mike Sonnix of the Phoenix Business Journal, and Steve Goldstein from KJZZ Radio. In a lopsided 7-2 decision, the U.S. Supreme Court struck down part of an Arizona voter registration law. Amanda, what was the issue here? Give us kind of a general overview, and we'll take it from there. The Arizona law, and you remember the debates of it, was Prop 200 back in 2004. It kind of launched all of the uh, the immigration-oriented legislation we've seen in the 10 years since then. But the law went after both the federal form for, reg for voter registration and the state form, and the Supreme Court said you cannot put requirements that could uh, burden people's ability to register to vote on the federal form. And so that's what this, this decision came down to, is the use of the federal form. And the federal form is basically a postcard, correct? Yeah, basically. And, and it, was, it was a part and parcel of all these cases that we've gone through with, with the feds. Where the state, what, what rights the states have, where does federal law preempt state law and these things? And, and the court, Scalia wrote the, the decision that kind of shows you where the court was at on this, um, you know, said the federal law preempted this, what the state was trying to do. Scalia wrote the decision, Steve. Was Scalia, in the decision, Scalia also said, by the way, if you want to get around right. this, here's what you need to do. Right, and watching Paul Bender on your show earlier this week, it was confusing to say that this was a 7 to 2. It was almost like a, a kind of a 6 and sort of a 1, and then yeah. we had the other 2 in there. The interesting thing about Scalia is he's almost saying, okay, Arizona, if you can prove something in the future this has happened, come back to us and bring a new case forward. And yet, from what Paul Bender said, some legal experts I spoke to this week, it's again almost a solution in search of a problem. It doesn't seem like, and I'm talking to one expert, voter fraud and voter suppression, it's almost like to get the the people excited on both sides, it's not really as large a problem as it had been in past decades. And another option that, that Scalia even mentioned in the opinion was you, you can always go to the federal agency overseeing federal elections and say, hey, if you add this provision, if you add it, we can add it. Right, and, and, and Arizona went to that commission before and they didn't act um, or they tied or something on, on the law, and yes. we just didn't pursue it any further. Terry Goddard was uh, attorney general at that point, and he dropped it. Um, and what Horn's saying is he sh that Goddard should have appealed and we would have won on appeal. Um, I don't think that's so clear. I mean, there's a lot of experts who think that we wouldn't. Um, it was a really weird Supreme Court decision, though, for them to go, like, hint, hint, you didn't have to come the whole way to the Supreme <laughs> Court. You just needed to go to this commission and fill out some paperwork. I mean, it was it was a kind of a mundane approach to the Supreme Court decision, if you will. Yeah, you know? Louisiana had gone to that agency and, and, and got some additions and changes to the, the card. So they could follow that road. So, yeah, it was, it was you know, where the headline where it got struck down, it was a little more nuanced and complicated than that. And this isn't an Arizona issue exclusively. Mm -hmm. There are other states that have similar laws. Uh, Alabama, Georgia, and Kansas, for example, are the ones that, that are, are most similar and whose laws could also be affected by this Supreme Court decision and whatever Arizona does next. If they mm -hmm. come and they, they go to the commission and get, and get the permission to change the, the requirements for the federal form. And those are states that often follow our lead on other immigration things like 1070. <laughs> Indeed. And let's go back to what you were talking about, mm -hmm. Steve, whether this was a, a solution in search of a problem. We had Secretary of State Ken Bennett on here, Chief of Elections here in the state, and he says anything you can do to keep any kind of fraud happening is worth doing. And I respect where Secretary of State Bennett is coming from. Based on speaking with experts, I feel like he is running for governor potentially. I think he wants to <laughs> reinforce the fact that he has supporters who feel the same way he does. And it's not to say that we shouldn't try to get rid of all this, but the idea is that this should be some sort of priority that we're having some nuanced decision from the Supreme Court, it's not solving anything. So we're just sending out more lawsuits that isn't going, again, it's a problem that isn't really there. It's not to say that there isn't a minuscule problem there, but something to push all this political capital after shows something else is involved. Well, and there's a fine line here, and what the Supreme Court has said and, and you know, in multiple decisions is there's a fine line between protecting the vote as the Republican pushers of this bill, you know, this law had wanted, which is, you know, we protect the vote from fraud, protect, uh, protect the vote from non-citizens voting. 
But the other side is you have to make voting accessible to people who can legally vote, and that fine line is what they're afraid that this law has crossed. And you're talking about uh, minorities, uh, students, uh, some of the elderly. Mm -hmm. It's difficult for them, say those who are opposed to this law, to go through all of this paperwork when, again, the motor voter law, the federal law that this is based on, it was designed to make it easier. Yeah, I mean, Republicans really fought motor voter back in that, back a couple decades ago. They, they fought that tooth and nail all along, and so this is kind of part of that that debate and their approach on that issue. And Native Americans are part of that group that you know faces challenges from laws like these. So it, and yes. the, the reality is, let's look at the people who experts say have the most trouble complying. They are most likely to vote Democratic. This is not lost on the politicians pushing these bills. I'm not impugning their motives and saying they're not also trying to protect the vote, but the politics can't be taken away from here. Democrats are fighting these, these laws because they want these voters to have more access to vote and Republicans don't. And Republicans are also pushing for these things because it helps them in their campaigns as well, as I think mm -hmm. as you alluded to regarding uh, governor races and such. All right, I, we will no doubt see more of this story somewhere along mm -hmm. the line. And, and there's more to come, Ted, next week. Uh, with Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, Supreme Court will rule on that, which could affect Arizona as well. Yeah, yeah. all right, so we'll, we'll hang on for that one. All right, uh, closer to home, a court hearing on the, uh, the racial profiling case, uh, Mike, with the uh, Maricopa County uh, uh, Sheriff's Office. Apparently, uh, they're going to go ahead and appeal uh, this this ruling that the sheriff's office engaged in racial profiling. Talk to us about yeah, that. Yeah, the MCSL is going to appeal this, uh, the order from the federal judge and the ruling that, that they, they mistreated or, or racially profiled Hispanics in traffic stops, how they treated them in, in jails. And the, the, the appeal is going to be kind of uh, multi-pronged. Um, they kind of questioned what some of the judge's ruling, some of the things he did, his ruling. But they're also going to talk about what the feds did. Um, uh, the MCSO deputies were trained by Homeland Security in some of these enforcement things that they were going to say, well, well you you guys trained us and now, you know, isn't it your fault? So we'll see how many different kind of things they kind of throw at the wall on this. And who pays for this? Is the county going to pay for this? Uh, the Board of Supervisors? Will is they, will the they county going to pay for this? I think that's still being determined. I think they're still figuring out Bill Montgomery has a say in this. Or Joe could just go to his pretty deep-pocketed legal defense fund and, and try to hire a private attorney for this, too. I wonder if all of this comes down to that big issue of the court-appointed monitor. Because it did seem like, based on what Sheriff Arpaio's attorney, Tim Casey, said, it sounded like, okay, we're willing to go along with this. We've sort of stopped doing the sweeps even a year ago, so we haven't been doing those most recently. So I think there's a key there with a monitor. He just does not want, again, because we've gone through the recall, which didn't happen. Sheriff Arpaio was reelected again. So why should this person who was elected by the voters again have to have a court-appointed monitor? Seems like big brother. And I think that's what they're mostly opposed yeah, I mean, to. They, they've done a lot to step away from, from the immigration raids. It's not on their website. It's not on their, their trucks anymore. If you go on and search mugshots, you don't see immigrants mm -hmm. as a crime on there. They say they're rescuing people from the desert in their press releases mm -hmm. instead of picking up undocumented immigrants. Um, they're having everybody, MCSO, go through training on, on, on how to treat people, how to treat people of different races, treat them the same, all those types of things. But I think, I think Steve's right. When they, when they talk about a monitor, that, that kind of raises things over there, and they really don't want that. Yes. Well, about control. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the sheriff doesn't want to lose uh, the control over mm -hmm. working as an office, and he says because he's an elected official that that would be an overstep of, mm -hmm. uh, of the federal government, but um, it becomes hard to figure out how you get a, a notoriously, um, I don't want well, uh, people will say a notoriously corrupt office. I, you know, it's but but an office that has uh, has has you know fought against efforts by the federal government to change its jails and other practices over a period of 20 years. Reluctant. Reluctant. That's the word I was looking for. There we yes. go. And we've said on this program, Ted, many times before, related to Medicaid expansion, the governor is trying to help her legacy. I think the sheriff at this point. I think I've said this before on the program before, I see him as the ultimate political animal. He was not anti-illegal immigrant, at least outwardly and publicly, until Andrew Thomas made it a major issue. So then he jumped in. Now I feel like he's sort of sliding away from that. And he would, not that he's going away anytime soon, but I think the idea is a court-appointed monitor, but well, that's really going to look bad for his legacy. Let's fight that part. We'll go along with everything else. The sheriff will go back to doing his normal things. I think there's something to that. But what, wouldn't a, couldn't you quietly have the court-appointed monitor in there? But because the court-appointed monitor is something the Department of Justice was interested in. And, and last week we had a hearing in which well, there's a Justice Department saying, hey, we want to be involved in the talks too. You may have an all-encompassing solution, resolution to all this. If you're the sheriff and you want to keep things quiet and you want to become a good old Joe Arpaio again like you were before the immigration, to a certain degree, uh, flared up, 
Why would you continue fighting? Why would you continue making headlines? Well, I think there's a couple things. Uh, I think you know they, they view a, a monitor as a receivership type thing, like they're giving up control mm -hmm. to the, basically the Obama administration, to the feds to do this. Politically, I think there's a, probably a concern. I think critics of the sheriff would say, you get somebody in there and you turn on the lights and all the, all the cockroaches um, spread and you start to uncover a lot of things that, that, the, that, that they might not want to find uncovered. I, I think both sides see kind of a political side to this and the sheriff, as Steve says, is a very political animal. And so I think that's his end game. And let me throw in one note of cynicism too, Ted. The more this is out there, the more the sheriff appears to be fighting this, the more money can be raised, maybe not for him, but maybe for some protege at some point. Yeah, and you said, why would he want to continue the headlines? Have we ever seen a moment at any point in the 20 years that our pilots well, ran for any, from any kind of headline? Well, that, I mean, I, that I, is I, what I was, my position, I was just trying to counter. The yeah. other idea was that he's maybe sliding away from all this and doesn't want those kinds of headlines. So I'm, I'm just wondering. Yeah, you know, just to putting that out there. And this issue has been a winner for him politically. He's been reelected. He's raised a lot of money. He'll raise more money uh, on this. And while he is stepping back from this, and I don't think he's a true believer in the immigration cause, it's politically been good for him and, and good for his campaign funding. And we should note that the challenge, the, uh, the appeal, kind of is based on a couple of things that the, the judge said during that hearing. The ruling that the judge made was very comprehensive in some ways, but a little cryptic in others. And he clarified, I guess, uh, from, from that last uh, the last ruling. He did so last week and has taken a week for the sheriff's attorneys basically to say this business of you can't detain someone uh, until you contact ICE and these sorts of things, uh, we're challenging on that. There's a lot to parse through, Ted, and, and we can look at Judge Snow's ruling was seen as a, an obvious victory to some against the sheriff, but there, if you really look closely, I don't know. I, I'm, not, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not sure exactly how it worked out. But yeah, there are certain things to challenge. I'm, I'm, I'm sure, absolutely. It'll be really interesting to see when the, there is a ruling in the Department of Justice case because the, it's different evidence. But if they came up with a decidedly different ruling against the sheriff, um, you know, if they didn't find evidence of racial profiling, perhaps if yes. DOJ loses, that could be really remarkable to have two different cases, um, yeah, finding absolutely. different conclusions. And the headlines would keep rolling in. Oh, yeah. For better or worse. <laughs> um, the U.S. Senate uh, immigration reform update. It sounds like we have a compromise now on this idea. This Idea. The border surge seemed to win over some votes here, huh? And that was the entire aim, once again, to be cynical. It's about getting as many senators on board, especially Republican senators on board, as possible. It looks like all of the Democrats, so I guess that's 54, were going to be on board with this. But other than the gang of eight, not that much. Orrin Hatch voted for one amendment. Would he go along with everything? So this is a matter of potentially adding 20,000 more Border Patrol agents, another 350 miles of border fencing, and about thirty billion dollars, which is the estimate, but since it's estimated at thirty billion, I'm sure it's a heck of a lot more than that. So to get a lot of Republicans to go along with that kind of spending is kind of interesting as well. But there was much more enthusiasm because it's border security, it's border security. If you can get more Senate votes, maybe that pushes it through the House. It's going to go to a lot of those defense and security contractors that uh, have a lot of influence in Washington, surprisingly enough. Maybe they can build another one of those invisible fences like, like Boeing tried to build down there, but they could get seventy votes. Uh, in the Senate after after this. And there's drones. The drone issue is going to pop up on this because there's been talk of 24-7 drones over over the border. Um, and there's obviously that has its own debate uh, in terms of uh, the, the aerospace defense industry on one side and then obviously privacy and, and our big brother state on the other. $3.2 billion just in the security surveillance drone aspect alone. That's and a lot of buckage. It really, uh, it really impacts the, uh, the the amount of savings that the Congressional Budget Office just said that they would come up with off this bill. They, they estimated that in the first 10 years that, that the reforms in the bill would save $175 billion and, over, and $500 billion over the following 10 years. Um, I think it was $500 billion, $700 billion over the following 10 years. Um, so now you're adding more costs, $30 billion to ramp up but, this but new security, and you're eating away at that. But wasn't that the idea? I mean, once they found out, once the CEO came back and <laughs> said, you're going to save all this money. Wasn't that the idea? Let's use some of this money. Let's get that security issue Absolutely. confirmed so we can get Republicans on board. Isn't that what happened? Absolutely. That's what it's all about. It's all about getting Republicans on board. I'm still interested, though, in what happens in the House, because I think most of us thought the Senate would potentially, at least two-thirds, would, would approve this. The House, though, I, is going to get stuck on this path to citizenship. They can say border security all they want. That is the big issue. If this were a guest worker program, or temporary, or something, fine. Mm -hmm. Citizenship is going to be almost impossible. What House. happens in the House? Well, the mentality there is not to pass anything. They ha can't pass a budget. They can't pass much of anything. Mm -hmm. um, so you would think they wouldn't be able to pass this. It's a chance to oppose the president, oppose Senate Democrats and moderates, 
their constituents, the ones they care about, the, the, the caucus, the Republican caucus, they're prone to oppose this. I don't see what their motivation is, is to support this. The, the border security is part of it because defense security companies have a ton of influence there. And, and you could say, look, Boeing, Raytheon, all these companies have a lot of jobs in your district. Mm -hmm. These might help you. But, boy, but they're, not, they're, not, they're not built to pass stuff there. I don't want to contradict myself, Ted, because it's something I just said. But I did speak with uh, recently retired Senator John Kyle just a week or so ago, who was heavily involved in 2007 mm -hmm. with the immigration reform. And he said, okay, Senate is fine. He said the key thing on his side, how he can say this because he's a former politician, is that the politics have to be removed from the situation for both Democrats and Republicans. Democrats really want to have to get a bill, and Republicans don't want to be the guys who stopped a bill. Mm -hmm. So he says there are enough people of what he called good faith in the House that there will be, he thinks they can find compromise, but he thinks it's going to be razor thin. Well, there's a huge debate in the Republican Party on this politically. We've, the Republicans have to say, well, we've, we've alienated Hispanics so much, look how much Romney lost by, we need to have a big tent. Um, and the other side, the folks say, well, you're going to legalize all these immigrants. They're all going to be Democrats. They think Obama's the one that did this. They're probably, most of them are lower economic uh, status. So they're prone to be Democrats. So we're going to stack the deck against ourselves. How much in the House would be, uh, uh, how many uh, Republicans in the House, Tea Party types, would be upset just at the $30 billion price tag? I don't know. This is an area you can spend money on, right? If you're in the Tea Party, you could spend money on border security, and you can spend money even though most analysis show that we are at a point of diminishing returns, that you can put more drones, you can put more boots on the ground, you're going to catch like 10 more guys. I mean, it's, it's an exaggeration, but I mean, there, there are a lot of studies showing that it's to get to that last percent to secure, the, to secure the border more than it is now, and it is by every measure more secure now than it has ever been at any point in our history. Um, to secure it more is a big price tag, and you do run up against diminishing returns. I, I think the legal path, the amnesty, is, is the big sticking point, mm -hmm. and that's, that's the, the elephant in the room. Uh, Trent Franks, uh, Congressman Franks, is the main sponsor of a House anti-abortion bill that uh, so, uh, the, the pro-life uh, groups are saying is one of the greatest measures they've seen in years, the most important, most impactful. Most others say it's going nowhere. The Senate will certainly not yeah. pass it, and the president almost definitely wouldn't sign it. Um, Talk about the bill and talk about uh, the mess that uh, Congressman Franks kind of got himself into explaining the bill. Well, it I think it restricts bo abortions after 22, 22 weeks. That's 20 weeks. 20 weeks, 20 weeks yeah. so that's five months, right? Um, uh, pass on a party line vote. Um, it's another attempt by you know, the pro-life folks to, to push the envelope on this towards their end and further restrict uh, abortion rights. Obviously, it's not going to place any place in the Senate. It's certainly going to get past the president. You know, it basically appeals to pro-life folks, brandishes uh, Trent Franks as a, as a conservative. Um, again, a Republican made some comments, Trent Franks this time, about abortion and, and rape. I think they need to go through a training. Just do not talk <laughs> about that issue, right? You can talk, abortion has a hot enough issue. Every time Republicans seem to talk about that, we saw it in some Senate races, Aiken and Missouri lost, right, uh, because of that. Uh, Indiana had this problem, too. Um, so it's it's uh, he got in some hot water for for talking about uh, rapes not ending not ending in pregnancy a lot of times. Yeah, pregnancy from rape is rare. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, and it didn't keep it from passing. But it was interesting just to get into sort of the minutia of this is that Franks was the sponsor of the bill, and then because of his statement, mm, okay, you, you can you're not the manager of this bill anymore. Bye bye. So we're going to go with it. But we're going to put out someone who's going to be a friendlier face and won't say things. A Republican woman. Exactly. And the exceptions for and the exceptions were for rape included. and incest that he yes. didn't want were included. So. And, and, and this, what this bill does is that it's modeled after bills that have been passed, laws that have been passed in the states, including in Arizona. We mm -hmm. passed a 20-week abortion ban that was struck down. Um, I think it was Indi uh, Idaho's also was struck down, also at the 20-week. So as of now, Supreme Court precedence is that you can't ban abortion prior to viability, prior to the point where the fetus or, or baby can survive outside of the womb, which is generally at 24 weeks. And there's another nuance that I think is really interesting here. You're not hearing much in the national debate, but we certainly heard it on the state debate, and that is what happens at 20 weeks. At 20 weeks is when a pregnant woman gets a more advanced, um, I think it's a sonogram, that show, can show whether there's fetal anomalies. It's at 20 weeks when you learn whether your baby has a brain. Um, so women who abort at this point often abort because of fetal anomalies, because they discover the child has, may have Down syndrome, may have uh, anencephaly, which means doesn't have a fully developed brain. And so that, the banning abortion at that point is seen by pro-abortion groups as, as really restrictive of a woman's right and cruel. And so, again, this is basically a way to justify uh, the pro-life crowd for basically saying, here's what we did, here's what we've done. 
it's not going to go much farther. Yeah, the issue is never going away. I mean, it's it's, it's a, one of the central issues of American politics since since Roe v. Wade, and, and both sides raise money off that. It's it's a bellwether issue for so many. It's a hot button issue for so many people. If if you have a different president in there, a different Senate um, coming up, you bring it back up. And again, there's court challenges always on this, and and the folks on the anti-abortion side want to have less abortions. So so anything they can do to kind of move the the puck that way, um, they're going to try. And maybe this is a stretch, but this is what makes Trent Franks interesting. This is his one issue, and he's a congressman. This is not a legislator. It's a congressman. Right, right. And it is his one issue. I mean, this is what he is known for and what he'll always be known for. Um, you mentioned Puck. You're trying to get me to talk about the Coyotes, but I'm not going to do it quite yet because we've got to talk about this initiative to, to repeal Medicaid expansion. Obviously, a bill signed, uh, passed. Everything's a done deal except for, more than likely, a court challenge, Steve, regarding the supermajority thing. And now yes. we have former lawmakers saying not so fast. Frank Antonori and Ron Gould, who were not big fans of the governor anyway, even though they share a party with her. Ron Gould was the one who got up during the governor's State of the State address saying she wanted the Prop 100 sales tax increase. He walked. So, <clears throat> pardon me, Ted. The interesting thing about these two is that it's almost like bitter politics again. These two are saying that folks like John McComish, uh, Rich Crandall are traitors to the Republican Party. And so, therefore, this is not what Arizona Republicans want. It's time to get something out there so that voters can give it a shot and somehow repeal it, or actually before it even goes into effect in 2014, just stop it in its tracks. Um, they have to get 86,000 signatures, valid signatures, to get it on the ballot. Talk with Glenn Hammer of the Arizona Chamber of Commerce this week. He said he's hoping for a lot of hot days this summer, mm -hmm. so it's hard to collect those signatures. So <laughs> The funny thing is, it, it, regardless of whether or not it would pass, get it on the ballot automatically delays implementation. It does, mm -hmm. and, and it could delay people in Arizona who are uninsured getting coverage once mm -hmm. the federal mandate goes into effect in January. Um, and, and, but getting it on the ballot is going to be the big challenge. They're talking about doing this with volunteers. I don't think there's any example in modern political history in Arizona where you've gotten a, a voter's initiative on the ballot with voters. I mean, you get it on with paid signature gatherers. So unless someone comes in with some big cash to finance that collection, the, the signature collecting, uh, it it's, appears unlikely to make it to the ballot in the first place. And then once it does, there's the legal question about whether this is something you can even refer to the ballot. Indeed, because part of a budget you can't refer. And also something... W is there's another aspect as well, correct? Is it something that has to do with, is, that deals with the, the welfare of the state and the well-being of the state? There, there are a couple of avenues, I believe. Yeah. That and and the, the, the pro-expansion side is the state chamber, the hospitals, they have a lot of money. They raise money for commercials and for lobbying. You know, during the session when they pass this thing, they have the governor on their side. They have a lot of resources at their disposal. They could even go out and hire the petition gatherers to have them sit on their hands and not work for them. Um, uh, which is starting to happen more in some of these these measures. And, and, and less, unless these Tea Party folks get, get some money behind them from somebody in Las Vegas or somebody like that, um, they're going to have a hard time. And uh, it's hot, and it's a complicated issue. Other than saying, you, you know, do, do you want to repeal Obamacare, you can't sit down with somebody outside of a library um, on, in the afternoon and kind of explain the ins in and outs of this. It's yeah. going to be a big challenge. They're going to face legal challenges. I, I think the opponent's best shot is, is, is challenging the assessment as a tax. Yes, you know, uh, whether or not yeah. two-thirds majority. Yeah. For for if that. it quacks like a duck, it's, it's, a, it's a duck. <laughs> okay, uh, before we go, oh the Coyotes. Yeah. It's our I, favorite team. I hope this, is what, this will be <laughs> one of the final times we talk about this yeah. because it just seems to never end. But it sounds like we could be, we could be headed toward the finish line here. Yeah, the NHL's made it pretty clear that they need to get a deal done pretty sooner. They're going to they're gonna sell them and, and move them to Seattle or maybe Quebec City. Glendale Council met again today behind closed doors. They're always meeting private. Um, they came out and said, well, we might, we might, we're going to continue working on it. We might get a vote by July 2nd. So um, we've kicked the can to yet another D-Day on this. Uh, the sticking point is an arena deal between the, the city and this group of businessmen that want to buy the team and keep them here. They need $15 million a year to buy the team. They want to share some revenue, tickets, parking with the city, kind of offset the, uh, the price tag. It's just a tough go for the city. It's always been a tough go for anybody that wants to buy it because they lose a lot of money. Everybody wants the team to stay. It's just we've never been able to make the numbers work. One thing I love about the kicking the can idea is July 2nd is after the NHL's Board of Governors meets. I think it was June 27th. Yeah. And that's when Gary Bettman, the NHL commissioner, wanted this all settled. Mm -hmm. it's, it's so, sound, it's, it, indeed, and we talked about this earlier this week. It sounds like, they said, all right, we'll go to July 2nd. But it sounds like if something doesn't happen by July 2nd, uh, the Coyotes will be skating off into the distance. Well, and, and you can tell the Glendale officials, are, are the, especially the new council, is very reluctant to pay millionaires who own a sports team mm -hmm. money to come play in their town. Um, and, and I think that, is, that issue is obviously the sticking point. They were had offered the last 
potential buyer $17 million a year to manage the stadium. And then when the new council came in, they put it in their budget at $6 million. Yes. Um, so to fight to get it from $6 million to $15 million, again, they're kind of giving up on this, the hard stand they tried to take by saying we're not going to pay a lot of money to have this Except that revenue, the revenue sharing ideas where ticket surcharges and parking, they think might bridge the gap. But well, we haven't seen the details of that yet. No, it we could haven't. Be, it could be, you know, ticket sharing above a certain floor. And let's remember that the Coyotes have the worst attendance in the entire league. Yeah. So if they put something like, you know, it has to be so many, so many people in attendance to do the sharing, then. All right. You know. We got to stop it right there. Thank you so much for joining us. And that is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great weekend. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.